I have tasted and I have seen the realness of your love for me. It's written on your hands and feet. It's all the
children now. You are the same God. You are the same God who answered prayers back then, and you will answer now. You are the same God. You are the
for the presence of God. We thank you for the praises of God's people. And I thank you that as we praise and the presence of God fills the room as the anointing of God begins to descend upon us and come up from within us. I thank you, Father, that this anointing breaks the yoke of bondage. It, it removes the heavy burden. In Jesus' name we pray. In the name of the Lord. Oh God, our God, we need you. Now more than ever, we need you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Ah, I was glad when they said unto me, let's go into the house of the Lord. Yes, this is a place for God's presence, his peace, his power. So it's also a place for a lot of smiling people because they've been touched by God in all those areas. Find somebody, give them a good, healthy, heavy smile before you're seated. Will you do that? everybody. It's so good to see you here. It's a great day to be in church, and we're just delighted to spend Sunday morning with you. If this is your first time with us, welcome. We're so glad that you're here today. We'd love to get better acquainted with you, so we're asking if you would do us a favor and an honor. Stop by the Welcome Center on your way out. We have a gift we'd like to give you, and just get record of your visit. Say hi and answer any of your questions. We're um, just a group of people who love God and are serving God, and our lives have been changed because of the power of God. And so we would just love to do life with you as well. And so we invite you uh, to come back again. And again, if you have any questions, stop by the Welcome Center and we're just welcome. We're glad you're here. So things look a little bit different today because we've had a really busy weekend and I'll tell you about that in just a moment. But I want to bring a couple things to your attention. Uh, on September, on, we're all, not September yet, time does fly by, but on July 29th, it's a Saturday morning, at 10.30, we have a women's brunch that will be here, it's welcome to women of all ages, and it will be led by Sarah Villalobos, and a study and a message from her, it's going to be awesome, so women, come out, 10.30 on July 29th, the women's brunch, and then the next session of track will start on Wednesday, August 2nd, the, what the track is, it's four classes that help you get connected to the church. You learn about your own gifts and abilities and personalities, and you learn the heartbeat of OV Church. And so we just invite you to do that. That's the way to start getting connected and serving. And you know, we weren't made to do life alone, and, and serving is a lot of fun. So we encourage you to get involved in that way. So August 2nd, and you can register for the track online as well. So before I tell you about our weekend, we're going to give you opportunity to give in your tithes and your offerings. God is so good. 
He is so good. And, he, and Jesus came to give his life and to serve. And so we get to follow in his footsteps and carry that same heart of generosity in the giving of our tithes and our offerings. And so there's many ways to give. If you came prepared to give cash or check and you would like a tithe envelope, you can raise your hand. Our team would be glad to get you one. There are also envelopes available at our offering containers out in the lobby. You can give online at oakvalleychurch.org or on your phone app, and I think even text to give. So all kinds of ways to give. And so we just appreciate and are so thankful for you and your generosity. And um, together we're making a difference in this Inland Empire and even to the ends of the earth with our missions giving. And so we thank you for that. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to give back to you out of our resources, our time, our talents, and our our tithe and our offering. Father, we thank you that your hand of blessing is upon it, that it will be multiplied and go to further your kingdom and do your work. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, so we've had an amazing weekend, right kids? Yeah! Yeah! So we've had kids conference going on and tonight is the final night of kids conference. What um, they've been learning is um, ready, set, move. God has a plan and they're ready to move in it. They've been learning that they can trust God no matter what and that God is there to help them make the wise choices and that he has an amazing plan and purpose for them. And we could not have made this weekend happen if it were not for all of our fantastic, energy-filled, love-filled volunteers. And we just thank you so much. You guys are awesome. So thank you. We've had a great volunteer team. And we've had our teens volunteer to lead the dance. And so we're going to invite our kids to come on up. As many can squeeze on here. And they're going to perform for you our theme dance, which is Ready, Set, Move. And our teens, who have done an amazing job, are going to help them lead that, are going to lead them in that as well. And so thank you. Enjoy this. They're awesome. Hi, guys. Right, Ava, roll me.
All right, that was great. That's just a, a small smattering of kids. Uh, they have over 100 kids that have come and uh, are just really having a great, great time. This week has been crazy. Them, uh, everybody, the team here all week long getting ready. And I've really enjoyed the week because I just stayed home at my home office all week. Had a lot of time to myself. And in the evenings, uh, they're all here until late, and I'm just home enjoying myself. Uh, I'm tired from watching all the work that they have done. And uh, so it's been great. Been great. All right. Hey, this morning I am going to share uh, part three of Grow and Go. Uh, we began this series. Quite a while ago, we took a couple of weeks off last week for 4th of July, and then we had a couple of weeks, one for a youth takeover, one for Father's Day. And so uh, you may not remember, but in the first two weeks of the series, we taught from Scripture, firstly, about apologetics. And uh, what that is, is to give a defense of the gospel, our, our ability to articulate truth. We talked about that. And then the next week, we talked about family and friends and reaching them. Today, I want to share the responsibility that all of us have serving our world with the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. If you want to be like Jesus, and most of us do, we're followers of Jesus Christ. That's what we call ourselves. Well, Jesus left an example for us in terms of what it means to follow him. Let me give you three brief things just as a foundational uh, place to start. Number one, get personally involved in people's lives. Get personally involved in people's lives. John chapter 13, verses three through five says this. Jesus knew that the father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. He knew exactly why he was here and where he was going. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, wrapped a towel around his waist. He was with the disciples. And after that, the Bible says, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with a towel that was wrapped around him. And then from there, we go to verse 15. Verse 15 says, 
I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. What did Jesus do? He served other people. He served other people. That's why he was here. That's why he came to serve others. He didn't come to be served. He came to serve. Secondly, as a foundational principle, we serve people because we love people. Listen, if you're in the body of Christ, you need to learn to love people. How many of you know that some of the, the most difficult challenges in life is loving people? And yet serving people and loving people is what we are called by God to do. We again have illustration in scripture of just what that means. John chapter 3 verse 16 says this, God loved the people of this world so much that he gave his only son so that everyone who has faith in him will have eternal life and never really die. God loved the people of this world so much he gave up his only son. That's how much God loves people. Galatians chapter 5 verse 13 says this, my friends, you were chosen to be free. So don't use your freedom, talking to believers, you and I, as an excuse to do anything you want to do. Use it as an opportunity to serve each other with love. We've got to learn to love people. Love people who don't know Christ, love people who do. One of the most difficult things for me, I find, hearing in life is when I hear believers talk bad about believers. When, when I, I mean, I've heard people say this. I'll never, I'd rather do business with non-Christians than Christians. Christians burn me. They expect things. And and I'd rather just do something with non-Christians. Well, that may be true, but you telling everybody about it certainly doesn't help the cause of Christ. It certainly doesn't help uh, what, what God is wanting to work in people who are challenged in business or are challenged in character. God wants to do a good work in them. And so I, I think it's important for us, that's just an illustration, that we, we need to, if you, if you don't want to do business with somebody, that's, that's fine. Don't do business with somebody who lacks character. But if, but you know, I, I think for us as believers, we got to be really careful about how we we look at people who are like us, people who are trying to follow Christ, and how we talk about people who are like us, living this life trying to follow Christ. We need to serve people because we love people. Thirdly, third foundation this morning is be moved by people's stories. And we're going to really focus on this one today. Be moved by people's stories. Matthew chapter 9, verse 36 says this. But when he saw the multitudes, talking about Jesus, when he saw people, he was moved with compassion for them because he saw their weariness and he saw the fact that they were scattered like sheep without a shepherd. So he was moved by what they were experiencing in life. Listen, our responsibility to tell the good news to people who need good news, that responsibility is so important that he ingrained it within us to be able to hear the story of somebody's life and have a desire to do something about getting them on the right track, getting them on the right path. Listen, if somebody's drowning, you're not going to, and that someone who is drowning you love, you're not going to stand on the shore and say, hey, swim, hey, float. No, you're going to get wet. You're going to get wet. I had two dreams last night. One was silly. And I'm going to tell you the silly one right now. We're getting ready to go camping, and my sister sent a, a, a little thing on, on, uh, in a text about where we're camping because I'm going with our siblings and our children and our grandchildren. There'll probably be about 80 of us camping together. <clears throat> and uh, so little week's vacation is not going to be, you know, a whole lot of rest. But... <clears throat> um, and, and, and uh, they give some instruction. They said, and the bears are nice. <laughs> I thought to myself, 
It just doesn't work in the same sentence. The bears are nice. And, and I had seen something uh, not too long ago about a bear that just ripped open a, a, a tent and, and grabbed someone in the middle of the night out of the tent and dragged them off into the woods. And, and I'm getting ready to go camping where the bears are nice. There's a reason why I have a trailer, but not everybody does. And so if you're going camping with your tent, uh, you might want to close your ears for the next few moments. Actually, um, why did I get off on all of that? Let me, let me. <clears throat> what? Oh, I had a silly dream. That's right. I had a silly dream. And the silly dream was that uh, a bear came and ripped open a tent and grabbed one of my grandkids and started running, trotting off with, with one of my grandkids. Well, I didn't just, in the dream, watch, watch him drag off my grandkids. I ran faster than the bear. And I caught up to the bear. I stuck my thumbs in his eyes. And I then st stuck my fingers in his ears. I presume he was still moving with my grandkid. And I, and I just let him have it. And at the end of the dream, they came to take pictures of the bear. His face was all swollen. He was unconscious because Grandpa, <laughs> Poppy, had rescued the bear. Listen, if... We're to have the kind of love and compassion to be moved towards somebody's story. If somebody's drowning, we're to jump in and get wet and save them. If, if somebody is, is running somewhere or they shouldn't be, then we ought to run faster than them and catch them and turn them around. So this morning, I want to look at the story of a blind man in John chapter 9 who had many obstacles placed before him to get to a salvation experience. But I want you to notice that Jesus was in the middle of his story. And you need to place yourself in the middle of somebody's story. John chapter 9, I want to begin at verse 25. This is the blind man's simple testimony. Whether he is a sinner or not, I don't know. The Pharisees, the religious folk, had come against Jesus for healing the blind man. And, and the blind man, they called Jesus a sinner. And the blind man said, I don't know if he's a sinner or not. You want to know why he said that? Because he didn't know Jesus yet. I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind. I ran into him and now I see. That, that's the end of his story. Well, not quite the end, but that's almost the end of his story. I was blind, but now I see. The entirety of this chapter tells the full story of what he went through to get not only his sight, but to get spiritual transformation. So let's go back to verse 8 in this chapter. And the Bible said his neighbors... And those who had formerly seen him begging. Now, this is after his encounter with Jesus, after he received his sight. His neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Neighbors questioned his identity. How can they be saved? We know the real person that they are. Do they actually think they're going to get religion and all of a sudden they're good? That's what a lot of people say about people who have had an encounter with the Lord. What neighbors, by the way, neighbors are people who know you. What they're saying is this. Let's just keep him on our level. Let, let's just keep him where we are. Let's just keep him in the same prison that we're in. Let's just keep him in his old identity because then what that means is we don't have to change ours. His neighbor said, isn't that the same man? No, it's not the same man. He was blind, but now he can see. Then in verses 13 through 16, 
Not only do the neighbors question his identity, but religion questions his healing's authenticity. Let's read it. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had been blind. Pharisees were the religious leaders of the day. Now, the day on which Jesus had made the mud and opened the man's eye by putting mud in the, the man's eye. It was the Sabbath, by the way. You know why Jesus made mud and put it in his eye, don't you? Because in the Old Testament, uh, the Bible says, cursed is, is anyone, cursed is anyone who, who takes mud and, and or dirt and, and places it upon themselves. You know what Jesus did when he made mud? He took mud and he put it on the man's blindness and he cursed the blindness. And, and the man was healed as he went his way. But here comes the religious leaders and said, well, he got healed on the Sabbath. Let's go to the next verse. Therefore, the Pharisees asked how he had received his sight. Well, he put mud in my eyes, the man said, and I washed and now I see. And some of the Pharisees said, this man's not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. And others asked, how can a sinner perform such signs? So they were divided. They were divided. Religion questions the healing's authenticity. The, the he, religion will always question whether or not your encounter with God is real. Religion will always be about you. It, are you good enough to be healed? Are you good enough to have a relationship with Jesus? Have you done things the right way? It will leave you filled with guilt. It will leave you filled with condemnation and fearful that you will never measure up. And therefore, what you think you're ex you've experienced with God is not real and it's not true. That's what people who need Christ have to go through. They go through the fact that religious leaders are always, always, always going to say what you are religious people, what you're experiencing is not real because you're not good enough to experience it. People have to have to go through that. This blind man was no exception. Verse 17. So not only did the neighbors question his identity, religious or religion questions his encounter with Jesus and its authenticity. Now in verse 17, we read, then they turned again to the blind man. What have you to say about him? It was your eyes he opened. The man replied, he is a prophet. Now, all of a sudden, they're asking him, what have you to say about him? What is your opinion about this encounter you've had with Jesus? I mean, you know, the Pharisees already had a strong opinion about Jesus. They did. Now, they want this man to add his opinion to theirs about the authenticity of Jesus. They, they want him to ponder and op opine about whether or not what he experienced with Jesus was real. the truth about what he experienced. The more opinions in the Pharisees' eyes, the better. I think it's time for a little it's been said. Anybody in on that? It's been said. How about this? It's been said, stubborn people clinging to their opinion is the best proof of stupidity. It's been said, the fewer the facts, the stronger the opinion. It's been said, opinion is the chaos of superstition, misinformation, and prejudice coming together. It's been said, opinion is insecurity given too much power. And finally, it's been said, opinion lies somewhere between knowledge and ignorance. Don't let opinions become your reality. 
the blind man didn't, and he saw. I was blind, but now I see. There'll be a lot of opinions that are ready to be released on people that you want to share Jesus Christ with, a family member, a friend, a coworker. There'll be a lot of opinions by people around them that will tell them the experience that you have told them about. The good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ really isn't for them. But the proof is in the pudding. I, I, I was around Jesus, and I used to be this, but now I'm that. And where are they going to get that from? From you. From your examples. Opinions will always challenge the truth. People don't need opinions. They need the truth. Let's go to verses 18 through 21. Another thing that this blind man had to experience was the enemy making sure that family is put against family. They still did not believe that he had been blind and received his sight until they sent for the man's parents. Is this your son, they asked. Is this the one you say was born blind? How is it that now he can see? See, they're trying to get the family involved. Uh, we know he is our son, the parents said, and we, yeah, we know he was born blind, but how he can see now and who opened his eyes, we don't know. Why don't you ask him? He's old enough to speak for himself. See what the enemy does? As soon as somebody has an encounter with the Lord, and, and this encounter had nothing to do with salvation, this encounter, we'll get to that later, this encounter had everything to do with God just touching his life because he was moved with compassion for his condition physically. This tool by the enemy takes, uh, tries to, to use against somebody's salvation, somebody's experience with God, somebody's deliverance, somebody's transformation. It tries to pit a family member against a family member. And all through scripture, we see that God warns us of these kinds of things and, and tells us what we need to do. Exodus chapter 12, or 20, verse 12 says this, honor your father and your mother that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You want to live a long life? Honor mom and dad. You want to live a long life? Give honor. And, and the reason God tells us to give honor to our parents is because there will be the possibility we won't honor them Amen. because of things they've said, things they've done. Listen, nobody's perfect. <clears throat> People ask uh, this question all the time. <clears throat> what would you do over again in your life if you had the opportunity to do something over? <clears throat> and, you know, I think to myself, well, I, I see my children, my daughter and our three sons, and their spouses, and how well they do raising their children, and how they have, they have instilled in them a love for God. And, you know, that love for God they've instilled in their children, <clears throat> I, I really honor it because they don't make church optional. We never made church optional for our children. Because if we made church optional, then someday when they grow up and they've learned that church is optional, then God is optional. Then Jesus and his ability to change and transform their lives is optional. Oh, I'm preaching really good now. Amen. So good that uh, you're just holding that amen just to let it all <laughs> come out. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. It talks to parents. It, 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 it talks, the scripture talks to children, fathers, don't provoke your children to anger. Yeah. Discipline, instruct, 
but you don't have to do it by being the angry person all of the time. Proverbs 15, verse 20. Parents, children, Proverbs 15, 20. A wise son makes a glad father. Foolish man despises his mother. Wise son makes a glad father. A foolish man despises his mother. So if I hit everybody, I think children, parents, uh, if I haven't, let's read one more scripture. Luke chapter 12, verse 53. They'll be divided, father against son, son against father, mother against daughter, daughter against mother, mother mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law, daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. Don't be divided. Don't let the enemy use this ploy of division. And that's what they tried to do. The enemy tried to do when this man had an encounter, this blind man who now sees, had an encounter with God, tried to get family involved and draw a wedge. Don't allow him to. Well, what can I do? Family division really is the devil's ploy. What can I do? Because how many of you have family that just, you know, came from somebody other than than, uh, God? I mean, they're just, you know... Lord, have mercy. How, how in the world were they born in the same DNA here? I mean, how many of you have a, a cousin, who family member who's the devil's brother, sister, or somebody? <laughs> now you don't have to raise your hand. <clears throat> what can we do? Very simply, you can do what Scripture calls fail-proof. Fail-proof. 1 Corinthians 13, 8. Oh, that's too simple. No, it's, it's truth. Love never fails. Love never fails. Just keep loving, just keep loving, just keep loving. Oh, but they keep cursing, keep loving. They keep cursing, keep blessing. But, but they keep lying, keep telling the truth, keep, keep loving, keep loving, keep loving. Love never fails, love never fails. <clears throat> and then I love the conclusion of this story. Uh, the blind man's relationship with God and God himself are now attacked. Back to John chapter 9, look at verse 28. Verse 28 says, Then they hurled insults at the blind man and said, You are this fellow's, talking about Jesus, disciple. Well, we are disciples of Moses. <clears throat> we know that God spoke to Moses. But as for this fellow, Jesus, we don't even know where he comes from. And the blind man who doesn't really know Jesus yet, other than the fact that he was blind and now he sees, he said, wow, that's remarkable. You don't know where he comes from? And yet he opened my eyes? That's, that's amazing. Verse 32. Nobody has ever heard of opening the eyes of a, bl- of a man who was born blind. If this man were not from God, he couldn't have done what he did to get me to see. Amen. And he didn't even know Jesus yet. To this they replied, well, 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 you're a sinner. How dare you lecture us? And they threw him out. Thank God he got away from those religious people. I love, go back to verse 25. I just love that scripture verse. I don't know if he was a sinner or not. I don't really know him. One thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. I was blind. Why? Because somebody told him about Jesus. Somebody told him. And it totally changed his life. Joyce and I were struck by a conversation we had uh, with a young lady in our church, Erica. And and, um, when she she came to our office, this was quite a while ago, and she sat in, in, in front of us and she told us her story. And we were just crying. We, and, um, Eric, I don't know when you left if you knew this, but we went back into our office and we just looked at each other and we just, we had tears in our eyes because God had done a transforming work and we, we would have never known her story unless she told us her story. And I want you to hear a little bit of her story because somebody 
somebody in, in, somebody in, the, in the middle of the mess that she was in had gotten into, somebody had to step into that mess and tell her that Jesus loved her, remind her that Jesus loved her so that she could experience transformation again. Just, just watch, watch this. Hi guys, my name is Erica Camacho and I just wanted to tell you today a little bit about myself and my testimony. When my parents got saved, they were radically born again and so they decided just a short time after to start a church. As I got older, I didn't feel that I was good enough for God. So I thought that in order to be a Christian, you had to be perfect. It was a Christi it was Christianity, but it was very strict. Um, I wasn't allowed to go to school, uh, no TV, no music, no things like that. So I lived a very strict life. And so deep down inside, I always thought that there was something wrong with me because I knew that I couldn't live up to that perfection. I left home when I was 15 and um, went to Bible college. I made a mistake. I met a boy and the, the church and the um, college discommunicated me from, from uh, the church and the school and I was kicked out. I just was broken hearted because that was my dream. I wanted to be a missionary. I, you know, I wanted to be somebody for God and I wasn't allowed to be because the church, they broke me. <laughs> but I didn't realize that that was people, that that wasn't who God is. That wasn't the love of God. That wasn't the redeeming love of God. And I had no idea, so I, I left God. I, I left the church, I left my parents. I, I just gave up on myself. I gave up on, on being good enough so I, I told God I was like if you think I'm bad God then I'm gonna be bad I'm gonna be the worst I can be because that's who I am so I did you know very horrible things I was um, you know I was a drug addict I spent from the time I was 18 to three years ago in and out of of jail over and over and over I I lost myself I lost my my children I lost everything i was just saying if this is if this is who god is then i don't want anything to do with him so one day i was sitting in a in a, a cell room and and i had a minister invite us all to church she grabbed my hand and she said god loves you and i said no he, you know god doesn't love me he doesn't love me he can't love me i've done too much now for real i've done too much you know before i thought i was okay but now i really really have messed up and she said no she's like he loves you and my heart broke and i i fell down to my knees and just the love of god washed over me and i and i couldn't breathe i couldn't think straight it was a physical tangible heaviness that went upon my shoulders god brought me to my knees and the love of god just washed over me and that that is the the moment that my my life changed well the goodness of god has become so real to me so I prayed, I said, Lord, I need a home. I need somewhere to live. So I, I prayed and then I called about a house right down the street from this church. And I went and met with him. And he said that, you know what? I'm a Christian and God told me to go ahead and give you this house with no deposit, no first month's rent, nothing. He's like, you just go ahead and move in. So that's just a testimony in itself. God just kept blessing me and blessing me and I started working at a, a warehouse and now I'm actually have the keys to the building. I'm the area manager for a very large warehouse which is phenomenal for someone who three years ago had absolutely nothing, absolutely nothing. So God has done just phenomenal things for me and he has not let me down. Not one second has he let me down. 
my, my mother is with me, my children are with me, and I'm able to provide and I'm able to take care of, of everyone in my family because of what God has done for me. It's, it's mind-blowing. Jessica's in this, Jessica. Erica, I don't know why I always call Erica Jessica, Erica is in this service, Erica, we love you and appreciate you. Somebody reminded her, someone reminded her that God loves her. Someone saw somebody drowning and got wet. Somebody saw somebody running towards total destruction and they ran faster and caught up and let them know that God loves them. And throughout this blind man's story, from religious people to the enemy himself trying to pit his family against him, trying to challenge his identity and the truth of what he'd experienced, in, in the middle of that entire story of this blind man, Jesus is in the middle of it all. In verses 35 and 38, we read this. Jesus heard that the religious folk had thrown him out, and he went looking for him. He went looking for him. We have a responsibility to go looking for those who don't know Jesus. Everyone has a story. All they need is an opportunity to let God love them. Jesus heard that they had thrown him out. And when he found him, he said, do you believe in the son of man? Well, who is he, sir? The blind man said, I mean, he'd already become a theologian. He, he had already told the religious folk, hey, I was blind and now I see. How is it that you don't, you can't see this? Who is he, sir? The man said, tell me so that I may believe in him. And Jesus said, you've now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. And the man said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. Romans chapter 10, verse 14 says these words. How can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they've never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? Right. Your friend, your family member, your coworker, the person that you see uh, off and on casually, your neighbor, they all have a story. And the enemy's doing his best to keep that, that, the, the rest of the story from being written, the end of their story to be found at the feet of Jesus. But they're never going to get the opportunity unless we tell them. God told the story of Jesus by writing it in the stars. When you look at the constellations, there's the gospel story in all of the stars. It's fascinating st study. God told the story of Jesus in all of the Jewish feasts and festivals. He told the story of Jesus. But the primary way he tells his story today in the church age, in, in this new covenant age in which we live, is through the mouthpiece of you and I. It's through us getting our feet wet when people don't know the Lord. People are hurting and in desperate need of a savior. <clears throat> Jesus is that savior and you and I are the tellers. <clears throat> I told you I had two dreams. Actually, the silly one was last night <clears throat> and Poppy Man saved the day and <laughs> beat up the bear. <clears throat> the other one I had was a few days ago and <clears throat> God often speaks to me in dreams I don't know how God communicates w with you, but one of the ways when God really wants to speak something 
<clears throat> he'll speak to me in a dream. And I always know this is different. This is different. And I had a dream. And, <clears throat> and every time I have a dream from God, first thing I do when I wake up is I write it down. <clears throat> and I'll, I'll tell Joyce, I'll say, <clears throat> give her her first cup of coffee. And I'll say, I had a God dream last night. And so it's like, uh uh-huh. <laughs> And I, 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 I wait to tell her. But I had a dream, and in the dream, this was this past week, we were having church service, and I, I walked in the back, uh, and I just stood in the back aisle, and I think we were worshiping. And all of a sudden, these two-by-four sticks, these, these wood two-by-fours came out from the side door, and all just kind of dancing on the stage. Now, this isn't the silly dream. This is the God dream. And a big line. And I had just asked God the question as I stood in the back, God, how can we build your kingdom? How can we grow your kingdom? And all of a sudden, I see these two by fours, and they're dancing on the stage. And I said, two by fours. We got to build the kingdom. And I started to run down the aisle. And as soon as I took two steps, they scurried off the stage. And I froze in my tracks. And I just stepped back again. And we're worshiping. And all of a sudden, <clears throat> these two by fours come back out from the side. And they're dancing. And I, and I see them. And I, I get excited. And I, and I say, we can build the kingdom with those two by fours. And I start towards them again, and they see my movement, and they run off the stage. And all of a sudden, one by one, people in the auditorium started to move toward the stage. And as they did, these two-by-fours danced back out. And one by one, people in the auditorium, and I'm standing in the back just watching, came up on the stage and they each one took one two by four. <clears throat> and the worship service was people started to build a building with these two by fours, one by one. And I stood back there in amazement. <clears throat> and God said to me, you, you, you can't build the kingdom that you desire to build just by desiring to build it. You can't build a kingdom that you desire to build just because you have all the right tools, and we do. You can't build the kingdom just on your own by yourself. You can't do it. But if everyone in the body will get my heart of compassion and move towards people, if everyone in the church family will... will go beyond all of the obstacles that not only they face in telling, but the people who are told the good news face in receiving. If people will move, if we will all move, and by the way, I was a part of you. I wasn't up here. I was there. And as as you came on the stage and grabbed a two-by-four and started to build a house, I got it. And I came up and I just grabbed a two by four, and I started building as well. Every single one of us have a responsibility. And I really believe that in the day we live in, I really believe there's going to be some amazing things that are already happening. And, And I believe that the church of Jesus Christ is going to build the kingdom of God. But I believe that it's going to take each of us to take personal responsibility. You know a good place to start? Just bring somebody to church. Let them get an experience, family. Let them experience God's presence, his manifest presence. Let them experience life in the word. Let them experience Jesus. And the way for that to happen is for them 
to get here. How can they ever know unless somebody tells them? I love Erica's story because um, she needed to be reminded of God's love. And, And somebody reminded her. And when she said, no, I can't, God can't love me, she didn't stop. She, like Jesus, went looking, and she found, and she held. <clears throat> and like the blind man, was able to receive a relationship with Jesus Christ. Father, I thank you for your word. <clears throat> I thank you, Father, for the responsibility you've given us as believers to tell the story of your goodness. And, and while we can shout out God is good all of the time, all of the time, Unless we tell people, unless we show people your goodness, Father, how are they ever going to know how much you love them? Just in the same way that you're moved with compassion towards them, let us be moved with compassion. Let us jump into the sea and rescue those that are perishing, Let us overtake those who are headed for for destruction. Let us, as Jude said, plunder hell. Let us populate heaven. I pray that this simple word will resonate with us and that we won't be able to get away from I was blind, but I had an encounter with Jesus, and now I see, and my life has been turned upside down. In Christ Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. Let's stand together.